money is flowing. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of confusion between that and the EI. I'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, so, so that was the first uh, program they introduced. The second program was a wage subsidy, and that was 75% of wages uh, that the government will pay for those businesses that rehire or continue to hire their employees. Uh, but the qualification is they would have had to experience a 30% decline in their sales. Okay. Uh, and they've amended that. So uh, last week we saw our prime minister uh, adjust a lot of these things. One of the adjustments was uh, you, um, you prior to uh, last last week, uh, you, the, the wage subsidy, uh, you needed a decline in revenue, okay, of uh, 30% and, and that allowed you to claim that wage subsidy. So uh, that one was the second one. The third one, was this $40,000 loan, which is very appealing to a lot of businesses. Uh, it's an interest-free loan. Uh, you uh, basically, if, if you borrow 40, uh, and if you repay 30 before December 31st, 2022, the $10,000 is free. So that's interesting. They've made revisions to that though, but it's still uh, available to uh, businesses. Uh, you need, uh, prior to uh, last week, the qualification for that $40,000 loan was that you needed a $50,000 payroll last year to qualify. So that was met with a lot of resistance. A lot of these businesses that need that kind of money uh, just don't have the payrolls to qualify. So the government dropped the payroll qualification from $50,000 to $20,000. Uh, so that's good news to some. It's still bad news for others that still don't qualify. So those are the three main programs. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, problems with that because it still leaves out a lot of uh, businesses. The small business, the sole proprietor uh, that may not have a payroll, that person, that business uh, has been left out to this point. Uh, that business certainly can go get the curb, the CERB, the $2,000 a month. But as far as financing their ongoing business, uh, they've been left out. A lot of uh, bitching and complaining about that one. So I think we might see some uh, some adjustment to that, hopefully, in the near future. Gary, I heard there's something about um, the for three months uh, rent subsidy for yeah, commercial so, enterprises. So that's a brand new one they introduced last week uh, called uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistant. Uh, it's available for April, May, and June rents. Um, now that program is still being on, uh, brought brought out. Okay, so we don't have all the spe the, the specifics about it. Uh, it's really money that's going to go to a landlord, the way we understand it, if the landlord actually provides a reduction in rent. So we're still a little unclear on all the specifications on that. It is a program that the uh, federal government wants to administer with the provincial government. So we see a lot of obstacles in the way before that thing comes out, but it is a program designed to help with the rents. So that's coming. Hey, thank you very much for the update. Jerry, I, I wanna talk to you, but one of the, the things we wanted to talk about today was uh, residential REITs. Yeah. and uh, why they are hot. So can, to start off, can you tell us like, what is the difference between uh, uh, private equity and just uh, investing something in the pub like a publicly traded security in the stock market, for example, what's the, what's the difference? Yeah, sure, okay. So, well, first of all, I, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say REITs are hot. Uh, you know, they've never been hot. They've, they've weathered the storm well. Okay, the re all the reasons why anybody would rent or invest in a REIT compared to the public stock markets is all unfolded. Uh, but to answer your question or to discuss the topic, uh, money, so there's, there's private money and there's public money. Okay, REITs can be both. REITs can be public and private. Uh, and, and to start the explanation, probably I should uh, bring out an analogy. When I talk to people about my uh, company, I talk to them about the five different marketplaces that exist in the investment marketplace. One is stocks, bonds, one is mutual funds, one is private equity, mortgages, and insurance. Those five marketplaces, if we get rid of mortgages and insurance for just one second as we talk about this, because really mortgages and insurance, we don't go to those industries for financial products as much as we do to the other three. So stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and, pri and private equity. So the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, those are what we call 
uh, publicly traded assets. They're in the public market, okay? Private equity is in the private market. And the main difference, the easiest way to explain it, is the difference is, is how they raise money and the, and, the, and the reporting requirements that the regulators, both those industries are governed by the Ontario Securities Commission. And they provide reporting uh, requirements if you go public or if you go raise money through the private. Uh, a public, uh, so, so basically, you know, maybe it's easy to explain. If a company wants to raise money, which is really where they're going into the public or the private markets, uh, if they want to go public, they have to go public. They have to go through an IPO process, an uh, initial public offering process. And uh, back in the day when I worked with Dundee Securities, it was kind of interesting because I was involved in all that. So what we would do to try to keep it real short is we, a company would come to us, they want to raise money in the pub public markets. We would, uh, we would go through the IPO process. So, so basically, let's keep it simple. They want to raise a million bucks. So we would go and value their company and we would say, okay, give us a million shares and those shares are worth a dollar each. Okay, keep it simple, a million shares, they wanna issue, they wanna raise a million bucks or a dollar each. So now we have a million shares that we go to the market with. Now, throughout that process, that's called an underwriting process. It's very expensive um, and, and so not a lot of companies go that route. Uh, plus, when they go that route, they're a public company. They now have shareholders, they have a board of directors, so there's some separation between the ownership and the actual administration of the company. So, but anyway, if they did, they raise a million dollars, they issue a million shares, we go to the market and we sell those shares on the publicly traded market, okay? That's a secondary market, that's an active market. There's always a buyer, there's always a seller. Okay, so that's how they raise their, their money. And, and to do that, these public companies uh, issue what's called a prospectus. And, and that's kind of the information that an investor would have to, to determine whether they want to invest in that company. And picture that perspective as a very thick, say 2000 page document, it's a very big document. Okay, so that's how you go and raise money in the public market. Now in comparison, in the private market, uh, basically, a, a, a company like we'll be talking today with uh, about Poolis. So, a company like that has to, they don't want to go public for many reasons. One, the, the cost, uh, they don't need to possibly, they can raise their money uh, elsewhere. They have to go through what's called an exempt market dealer. Okay, so when we go back to the five different separate marketplaces, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds are private equity, the, or sorry, are public equity. The private equity is where Poolis would raise money. And they have to register with what's called an exempt market dealer. And when they do that, they uh, <clears throat> basically they create what's called an offering mem mem memorandum, which is a document that investors use. Now compare that to the prospectus that a public company would use. Uh, prospectus is let's say a 2000 page document, an offering memorandum might be a 50 page document. So it's much less information Okay, but that's what's allowed in the exempt market dealer. Uh, so anyway, so a company like Poolis or any private equity company would register with an exempt market dealer, at which point uh, uh, dealing reps, okay, which Brian Mizzy uh, is going to join us. He's a dealing rep. Uh, they, they basically raise money for those companies. Now, there's different filing requirements. So, for example, a private company requires an annual audit. Okay, a public company requires a quarterly audit. Okay, so there's more uh, reporting guide guidelines that are uh, required. And when we value those companies, uh, again, it's, look, for the accountants out there that will understand this, we base it on the balance sheet and the income statement. In simple terms, we value a company, we look at the balance sheet, and we determine what the value of those assets are. <clears throat> on the income side of the equation, we have income. Income drives the valuation of the company. And the big difference, in my opinion, between these two companies is a publicly traded company on the stock market, their value is driven a lot by how they've done in the last quarter, which is really income driven. If they beat their expectations, their, their stock price go, goes up. Private equity company, really, we do an annual audit. Uh, the value is based a lot on the specific asset on the balance sheet component of that whole equation. So if that makes any sense, uh, one reason why I've always liked these, these private equity companies because they're more, their value is driven more on the balance sheet. And that, that's a better way, in my opinion, to protect the capital of people. 
Okay. Does that Larry, make sense? I don't know. Okay, that's a very good uh, comprehensive answer. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I, I would like to bring Brian on now. I just want to say the one, only one thing I disagree with, and that is that I do believe residential REITs are hot now. Um, there was recently an article about how a pension fund was uh, calling around looking to buy uh, residential REITs, uh, the, the other asset classes uh, in commercial real estate, uh, whether it's office or retail, are having a lot of trouble. Uh, obviously, we know the stock market is, uh, is, is not in good shape. Um, so there's a lot of desire for these, uh, for a product like a residential REIT where, uh, we know that right now the only pl place people can be is in their homes. Right. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to, uh, ask uh, Brian to join us. Brian, uh, uh, we just need to activate your, uh, video. Uh, um, you might have to click a button and then, uh, and then we're good to go. There we go. How are you today, hey. Brian? There you go. Good, good. Thanks, guys. Good. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Good, Jerry. How are you? Today? Good, good. Very good. Very good. Very good. I, I also just want to add that uh, with um, Jerry and uh, Brian's help, uh, they have introduced me to the good people at, H at Huxton Black, and uh, I also uh, recently became licensed as a, as a dealing representative. So, um, uh, uh, congratulations, but congratulations, David. Th David. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, and. Um, uh, Brian is, is I guess, the, the product lead on Pulis, and I've been hearing about this, uh, this product for a year. So first of all, Brian, if you would uh, tell us a bit about uh, uh, yourself, uh, about Huxton Black, and, uh, and why do you like uh, Pulis? Sure, yeah. Uh, quickly about myself, you know, I've been in the investment world since 1985 in the various uh, capacities, worked a lot on the public side as Jerry uh, explained the difference between the public and private. I worked with uh, a number of mutual fund companies. You know, I worked as a financial advisor, much like Larry, Jerry did uh, at the start, and then worked with some mutual fund companies running uh, uh, their national sales. Uh, was president of a hedge fund company, became president of a hedge fund company for a while. So I've been exposed to almost every type of product there is on the public side. You know, uh, in the last 15 years, I've been working more independently and working more on the private side and working with companies to help them raise capital, help them structure products and that to meet the needs of the, of the uh, investing public. Uh, you know, I more recently I've been focusing probably the last six, seven years in the real estate area more, more so in the various types of uh, private investments that are, are available on, on that side. Uh, yeah, about just over a year ago now, I, I teamed up with Huxton Black uh, to to uh, allow me to be licensed through the Ontario Securities Commission on the, through the third cent market dealer, to allow me to do things like this more, you know, talk to the public and be able to talk about some private offerings uh, like Poolist, you know, with, you know, with staying within the guidelines of the, uh, of the OSC and, and uh, be able to answer retail based uh, investor questions. You know, Huxton Black, just quickly, Huxton Black is a portfolio manager and an exempt market dealer. Uh, as a portfolio manager, they, they focus on high net worth individuals. They've taken a, I guess the technology side that the robo advisors everybody's heard about, they've taken that a step further. They looked at that and saw some flaws in that system and then tried to refine it for high net worth people. So they, they utilize all the best things from a robo advisor in terms of the technology and access to information and, and uh, modeling portfolios, but also have added the personal touch. So they meet with every client, you know, so it's more like you would, you would want and expect for high net worth individuals, but by utilizing the technology, it allows them to be a lot more efficient, a lot more cost effective uh, and the like. So at Huxton Black, we can deal with things on the public side through the portfolio management side or through the exempt market dealer side where I'm licensed, uh, we can deal with the private offerings as Jerry alluded to the difference between uh, the public and private. So we can, we can cover all bases for individuals. Uh, Myself personally, you know, in my role with Huxton Black, um, as, a, as they said, mentioned, I'm licensed as a uh, dealing representative, which allows me to deal with clients, but also I, I work a lot with the team to vet products, to see what products uh, can, can meet the criteria of our investors and make sure that we have the best of in class from various areas, whether it's real estate or private equity and, and the likes. You know, 
Poulos is one that uh, I've had a long-standing relationship with. I've known the people at Poulos for probably eight years. Uh, in the last few years, I've started to work with them more closely. Uh, family-run business. They've been around since 2002 and very successful in what they're doing. And what, what they do is they invest in multifamily residential. And like a lot of people in this area, they started out small, dealing with smaller buildings. And today, the uh, their limited partnership uh, structure that they make available for our retail investors invest in larger apartment buildings, 60, 70 unit buildings. Uh, their approach is pretty simple when it comes down to it. They look at buying uh, older buildings, you know, underserviced uh, buildings, you know, well maintained but not updated. From sort of the 60s and 70s, they focus on the secondary markets around the Toronto area, but right now their main focus is in the Hamilton market. And they go in and buy these uh, these properties, usually directly as opposed to through real estate agents, so they can get better pricing on it. And they buy them with the idea of doing a true value add uh, approach to it. And what I mean by that is they go in with the attitude of buying this this property today and doing major renovations to it. So they're not just going in and slapping paint on the wall. They're actually doing major work to it to upgrade the buildings to bring it up to up to scale to compete with newer condos that are being built in the area. Uh, Poulos' approach is, is unique in that they they do their own research when it comes to purchasing buildings, but also their own project managers. So when they go in and they buy a building and they look at the cost associated with renovating it, they can uh, get a strong estimate and as well as keep to that estimate. So driving things themselves, they can keep timelines in line, cost, avoid cost overruns and the like. And thirdly, they're also the property manager. So when they get in, <clears throat> they can get the right type of tenant to come in, one that they can uh, work with and, and attract the rights prop for the property so they can get the maximum rents for it. Most of the buildings, when they buy them, their average rents are in the eight dollars $900 a month range. <clears throat> After the renovations, they've been experienced somewhere around the fourteen to $1,600 a month in rent. You know, and as Jerry alluded to, with, with a lot of these, uh, with privates and with apartment REITs specifically, the way that the, the investment is valued is not like a individual condo or uh, rental property you may buy. It's valued more like a business. So they look at the balance sheet. They look at the income. Uh, so when you look at valuing apartment buildings, you know, you look at the income, the net income being generated. And with coolest, what you get at the end is a property where the rents increases, the operating costs reduce because they move a lot of the common elements into the units like laundry facilities, heating and air conditioning, uh, and put the cost onto the tenants. You know, so in the end, their net income out of the, out of the, the buildings increases dramatically, and, and with it, you get stronger valuations. So for an investor, what they do is they provide you an opportunity to get good income plus good capital growth over you know, mid to long term investments. Okay, um, very good. Thanks for that, Brian. Brian, uh, uh, two questions. Uh, are we allowed to talk uh, publicly about the kinds of returns that people get? And also, um, I'm, I'm interested in talking a bit about the, uh, the tax advantages of a REIT. Uh, maybe Jerry wants to talk about that. But first, do you, do you want to comment on the first question? Sure, yeah, we can talk about returns. So Pool you know, has, uh, has been around since 2002. Uh, they had a, an LP that they offered up, their first LP, uh, that w had a defined termination date. So it ran for approximately eight years. The target of that fund was to provide 8% return for investors plus additional gains on the back end. So people went in for the term. When they exited, at the end, of, when they terminated the LP, investors got back their principal plus their 8% plus a bonus that brought them up into that 10% range. So the the product as structured did exactly as it uh, as it was uh, promised to do. And the new LP that they currently have offered, it's structured a little bit different. It's an open-ended product, so there's no termination date, but there's liquidity available for investors on a on a monthly basis. So it's it's a little more investor friendly. Uh, the way it's structured right now is that they're paying a six percent annualized distribution that's paid out on a quarterly basis, plus the growth in the uh, in the uh, buildings, so, uh, so they're targeting a 10 plus percent return uh, on an annualized basis over an average of three to five years. So it, what that means is you'll get your 6% each year. 
how much you get each year in capital uh, gains through your unit increase will vary from year to year. Some years it might be two, some years it might be four or more, but it's all going to vary depending on the buildings. You know, to give you an example, what what they can experience uh, a recent purchase. They bought a building recently that had 67 units. They purchased it for approximately 10 million dollars. Uh, they were looking to get, uh, looking to spend approximately three million on renovations for it. You know, with the rent increases that they expected out of it uh, in three to five years when they refinance, because they buy everything with the idea of holding it for the long term. Uh, they, uh, uh, when they refinance it, they expect to get a valuation in that 20, 22 million dollar range. So, for an investor, the, uh, holding like that would translate into the pool with the income as well as the capital gain and you own a piece of that type of growth. And that's sort of the, that's sort of the target of all their investments, you know, to work on that type of a model where there's an investment, initial investment, the cost and a return down the road that, that looks at to being in that sort of double of what the initial investment was. Okay. And as far as the tax, yeah, as far yeah, as the tax. tax. So because this, the, this is structured as a limited partnership, uh, it also has a trust element, which is eligible for RSPs and other registered uh, vehicles. So inside there, any of the growth is, is all tax sheltered and it operates like any other uh, RSP will, would, where there's no tax consequences until you withdraw your funds from your RSP. Uh, uh, for cash investments, it's because it's structured as an LP, each year the, the 6% income you receive will be, this portion of that can be reclassified as return of capital and in other cases there will some of the expenses on the renovations that flow through to investors so you'll get expenses to off, offset the gains uh, excuse me the income and, and on a net basis the six percent uh, distribution can turn out to on an after-tax basis to experience more around the eight percent range Okay. Can you jump in on that too, David? Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. On that. So, yeah, on the return on capital, I mean, that's one of the beauties of these type of investments. Most people, when they have money, uh, the rates are, you know, the types of returns they get uh, usually are just interest, capital gains, or dividends. Uh, with these REITs, uh, the beauty, and here's kind of how it works, I'll try to explain in simple terms. Uh, inside of the REIT, uh, we, for example, accounts have to come in and do the uh, year end. So inside the REIT, we have to figure out the income minus the expenses. Uh, the income tax allow uh, the income tax act allows us to depreciate those buildings. <clears throat> so inside of the fund, inside of the LP, uh, income minus expenses equals net income. If we can wipe out that income, which we can do with depreciation of the buildings, then our income for tax purposes is zero. And that, that way, the distributions that we're sending back to the investors, because it doesn't come out of income, it's a return of capital. And that's a beautiful thing, uh, because basically that income that comes back, it does not end up on your tax, tax return as income. Uh, so that's a great thing as far as tax planning, as far as the income that you can receive. Uh, it does reduce what we call the adjusted cost base of your investment. So for example, if you put in $100,000, if you got 6% back for the year, that 6% is money in your pocket. It's not taxable, does not go on your tax return. So it doesn't Im implicate other things on your tax uh, return, but your adjusted cost base went from hundred grand down to 94 when you resell that investment. Uh, so it does reduce your cost base, but that's a good thing too, because it's really uh, changing the characteristic of your investment from normal income to a capital gain, which is only half taxed. Half of a capital gain is tax free. So there's a lot of tax benefit. Without getting in deeper than that into the implications of the tax implications, uh, in general, those REITs uh, have, have, have good solid tax benefits attached to them. Okay, guys, um, there's some questions uh, <laughs> that have been posed uh, regarding uh, REITs in general and also. Uh, uh, investing. So I'm just going to address a couple of them. So how does one invest with Hux Hudson Black? Well, you call Brian or you call me. We're both dealing representatives with Hux Hudson Black. Uh, so that's uh, that's one question. Um, is it possible to get the slides 
there are no slides, but there will be a recording of the uh, a webinar. And if you have questions, definitely reach out to any of the panelists um, because uh, we would be happy to discuss the information further. Um, minimum investment with uh, Pulis REIT. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. With, with any private investment, uh, there's the, the actual uh, product uh, picks its minimums. But at the same time, there's qualifications for the investors. So depending on how you qualify, it, uh, it sets maximums on there or if you're eligible to invest, period. Uh, with Poolis itself, the minimum investment is $25,000. So you can invest any sum you want above that. Uh, and, but a lot of it comes down to how you qualify for the investment, whether it's an accredited, eligible, or a non-eligible investor. Right, because we, we have a requirement to make sure that all investments are suitable, right? So whenever we, right. we, we, we look at somebody uh, who's interested, we, we need to understand their overall uh, risk tolerance, um, uh, time horizons, and, uh, and other factors, and make sure that they don't uh, weight all of their investments too much, too much in uh, any one area and that they're properly balanced. Um, there's a couple of other questions and then, and then uh, we need to move on. Um, so let's see, uh, REITs have lost value in, in the last five to six weeks and can a mutual fund deviate from the distribution frequency as described in fund facts? I'm not sure if there's any relationship between um, those two questions, but- Can we jump, jump in on the valuation? Or... Okay, you can Go do ahead. it or I can talk to it, it's up to you. Well, here, I'll throw my input in and then you can add to it, Brian. Um, so uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, REITs can be uh, both uh, purchased in the public market and the private market. Uh, REITs that are in the public market will go up and down based on what the market is doing. Uh, and that really has nothing to do with the underlying asset. It's just the motion of the market. When the market goes down, everything goes down, basically. When the market goes up, everything goes up. On the private REITs, uh, again, the value is, is driven by the value of the apartment building as well as the income stream. The income stream comes from rent, okay? So as long as the rents uh, you know, are being uh, uh, earned, okay, even if they're not being received, because what's happened in the last month is we've had a government that's basically stood up and said, hey, people don't worry about paying, paying your rent. Well. You can't live in a place forever and not pay your rent. So uh, there might be a hiccup as far as the valuations because last uh, two weeks ago, we spoke to an appraiser who said their new you know, uh, appraising uh, methods involve you know, taking this into account. So there might be a little hiccup on that value, but the real value is still based on the real rent. You can't live in an apartment forever without getting kicked kicked out. So the rents will get collected. Uh, and even if the person does leave, if they can't afford the rents, uh, the new rent is more cases than not higher than the old rent. So in the private REIT, uh, the value is protected by the value of the actual building itself, plus the fact that we're collecting rent. So that rent is not going to go away. So uh, that value is maintained. Brian, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think where you're seeing drop in the valuations of are the public REITs, as, uh, as Jerry alluded to. Uh, but a lot of those are commercial REITs as well. So their models are a little bit different because they're dealing with, with a lot of these storefront, you know, strip plazas and so on that may, may be in trouble. You know, you never know if the tenants are coming back or not and, and, and the likes with all this going on. So some of them that you could have, like as Jerry said, it's going to be, uh, evaluation is really going to be based on the underlying assets and the income being generated. But because they're in the public market, people jump ahead and, and fear and greed get involved with it. And the volatility comes into the unit price where people try to predict what's going to happen in the future and they discount the, the uh, valuations. So if you look at any publicly traded REIT at their public, uh, at the number they actually trade at, if you go to the company, you'll see a, a net asset value. So they'll give you a true value of what their portfolio is. And usually what you'll see is that they trade at a discount to their net asset value. And, and you know, that's where, you know, on the public side, you take a little bit on the chin, you know, where we can get dramatic swings because the public all of a sudden perceives issues that may or may not exist. Uh, on the private side, you know, everything Jerry said was correct. You know, in the case of Poolis specifically,
specifically, with it being an apartment style REIT, they have taken taken it upon themselves to get out in front of all this. And if you look at their mall and the, the type of tenants, because they're in that mid mid range uh, after renovations as far as rent, they're a little bit protected in this. Um, you know, in that the tenants that they're bringing on into the new units are usually salary employees, and most of them aren't being affected as negatively by this uh, shutdown as, as other people are, and they have income to pay their rent. The other side of it, when they buy a building, you know, people that are in there paying the eight, nine hundred dollars a month are usually people that are actually already on government subsidies. So they're still getting their government money, so they can still pay their rent. There's a small portion in there that may fall in, you know, fall into this category where they may not have the income to pay their rent. And it actually pools this property management side has actually taken it upon themselves to be proactive and approach all these people and help them um, you know, with the process of getting the government money so that they can pay the rent. So, you know, as an individual, you, you can be intimidated by these government sites and trying to figure out how you fill out things and are you doing it correctly? And if you don't, it delays everything. Who else has taken it upon themselves to, to learn about the forms and which forms are, are needed and fill, helping uh, their tenants fill them out so they can get, uh, uh, they can apply for the, the, the grants and, or the subsidies right away and thereby continuing the cash flow into the pro, into the reach as they, as they have it. So, okay, Brian, um, yep. two quick things and then we got to move on. Number yep. one, do you want to give us your phone number? And also, um, do you want to just comment on the, the timing now? Because I think that Pulis, uh, there's a window of opportunity now if people are interested before the, uh, the price goes up when the new offering memorandum comes up uh, later this month. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a very small window. Um, yeah, so... As Jerry said, audits are done annually, and with the audits, they, they update their offering memorandum, right? So the LP has an offering memorandum, as Jerry alluded to. That gets refiled every year with the new financials, new holdings list, and, and so on, and any other little tweaks they might make to the OM to accommodate new uh, OSC rules or market conditions. Uh, so that, that renewal is coming up at the end of the month. Uh, next Friday is the cutoff date for any new investments, and Right now, you can purchase units of the LP at $116 a unit. So much like a mutual fund, it has a unit price that fluctuates over time, and that's where you get your capital gains out of it. After the renewal, the unit price is going to increase to 119 So there's a $3 move that's going to come in. So there's probably going to be about a six-week window where, while well, they get the new uh, OM up and running. But... Uh, up until next Friday, you have the opportunity to invest in, in the LP at the, at the lower price. Uh, if someone wants to get a hold of me, the easiest way is the uh, phone number, the cell number is 416-579-3375. You know, and obviously, David and Jerry both uh, know how to get a hold of me if, if necessary as well. Okay, Brian, we really appreciate it. Give us, a, give us a phone number one more time, and then we're going to let you go. Sure, it's 416 416- Five seven nine, three three seven five. All right. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Brian. It's uh, good to see you. We appreciate you being here today. Yeah, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. I'm also gonna um, Don. Well, I'll leave Don as it is. I upgraded him to a panelist by mistake. Okay, so uh, uh, there are more questions, but we can get to them a little bit later. I, I want to move on. Um, uh, Jerry, are there any comments before we move on to our next segment with Rena and Ernest? Uh, about the REITs or anything? Or just anything in general? Um, um, well, the uh, I think the REITs was well explained. Again, hopefully it uh, you know, emphasized the fact that I've, 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 I've said about these private REITs for years and years, uh, how, how they hold their... Uh, you know how they how they maintain their value and and are not affected by the uh, public stock stock market and uh, boy certainly what we've seen in the last month uh, ha, ha, has proven that uh, and again uh, these are residential private reads not uh, commercial not sure if I'd want to go into a commercial read at this point <laughs> given, Jerry uh, yeah. Jerry I, I wanted to ask you a question um, before we move on to the next segment because yeah. I know there were a number of extensions with respect to tax deadlines and. Um, it's obviously hard to even meet with clients. How are you coping with this situation now dealing with uh, 
not being able to meet face to face. Well, with yeah. So uh, actually, uh, even unbeknownst, uh, even before this whole COVID thing, I, I, I actually moved my tax. Uh, so I'm, I'm still a uh, registered public accountant. So I do a lot of corporate and personal tax work. And uh, I actually, before all this uh, COVID stuff happened, I actually moved my tax practice online. So I have a full uh, online capability to do uh, taxes now. So, uh, and then all of a sudden this COVID hit, which uh, certainly allowed me to continue to function as I normally would. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's helped me moving my tax plat platform on on online um you know as much as i like the uh human element of meeting clients uh, a lot of it now is online and video uh con con conferencing or meeting but uh that's a temporary thing but certainly the online platform has helped me continue to function to continue to communicate with my clients um, as far as the deadlines yeah the government has extended uh, our filing deadline for our personal tax returns is now june 1 okay it's not april 30th it's june 1 uh, and that may very well get extended too. I've heard that it might. <clears throat> uh, they basically have deferred uh, payment of HST, payment of income tax. Uh, you can push push that ahead. Uh, they're saying there's no interest on these things. Um, that's all been verbal. We haven't seen anything officially in writing. Uh, general comment, if you have the money to pay your taxes, pay your taxes. If you don't, then you're able to defer it. Again, there's a difference between when you pay your taxes and when you file your tax return. Uh, we want to make sure you're compliant on the filing deadlines of filing, because if you file late, you're going to get late filing penalties. Those are expensive. If you owe money and you pay it after the fact, that's not so bad because there's just charging a small interest rate on it. So the key is to make sure you file on time. So personally, our filing deadlines are June 1. Corporately, as they've always been, that hasn't changed. We still have to file the corporate tax filings six months after your year end. So if your year end is December 31st, you got to file your corporate tax return by June 30th. So, Okay, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you for that. So um, I'd like to move on now. Let's, uh, let's bring on um, Rena. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you some questions, but go ahead if you want to bring that. Uh, well, yeah, but we're, we're way behind schedule. Okay, sure. so. yeah. okay, I'm trying to activate. Uh, there we are. Hey, hey, Rena. Rena. Ernest, how are hey. you guys doing? Good, how are you? Hey, hey hello, everybody. Yeah. Rena, you're David in. David asked me to get my crystal ball, so I'm wearing my crystal hat. Nice hat, Ernest. Hi. Nice. <laughs> Rubbing the thing to see where we're going in the market. <laughs> okay, well that's a good that's a good start, Ernest. So where are we going in the market? What's happening? Tell us where we're going, Ernest. Since you <laughs> since you brought it up, what's what's happening? We're going for a ride. How's that? <laughs> what's what's happening with real estate development and what's happening in commercial real estate? Well, I think Jerry hit it on the nose. I, you know, I wouldn't want to be in retail or office at this time of my life. Uh, actually, I'm going to, here, this, this is what I'm focusing on here. This is my favorite. <laughs> now we're talking. You didn't, you, um, didn't, you didn't pay for that last hat, did, did you? I did. Did you pay did. for that last hat? I, I contributed to the cause. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Uncle G is my man. Okay. Anyways, um, well, you know, as far as the development you know, as I said to you, it, it all depends where this is all going to go and everybody's guess is everybody's guess, uh, I would assume. Um, right now, we are starting to see, as I mentioned to you, there's a couple of properties in receivership. So these are people that were extremely leveraged already. So there's a lot of builders out there who were buying stuff because they were, you know, thinking this thing was never going to end. And, you know, when you think that technically you know, from 95 until now, we've pretty much had a, an upline, a little blip in 2008, and we just kept going. And so uh, prices, you know, I remember when it was like $400 a square foot. Oh, my gosh. Then it was 500 and 600 Now GTA is 800 Downtown, 1200 Like, you know, we got Manhattan prices happening in Toronto, and people just kept going up and up and up. So, you know, these things... Um, one of the things I see is, um, you know, projects take a long time. They take six, seven, eight years to, to come to fruition. And, you know, then you go in sales, um, and those sales probably happened three, four, five years ago, depending on the location and the project. 
And so the builders are projecting certain incomes. And in that period, there's cost overruns and labor costs and delays and, and all kinds of things that go on. Uh, so their profit margin is not as big as they anticipated in some cases. Uh, we think these guys are making a fortune, but they're paying big bucks for land. They're paying big bucks for construction. Uh, you know, there's always something going on. Levies are keep going up. And I mean, it gets passed on. Um, I don't know if any of that answers your question. Where is this going? Um, I think, you know, it's the survival of the fittest. The guys with the deep pockets. Oh, we're losing it. Yeah. Okay. Hold Ernest. on. Uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of time. Ernest, we're going to come back to you because we have, we're losing your audio for a moment. Maybe you got a blip in the internet there. Uh, we're going to come. We're going to come back. Okay. To, let, let's go to Rena. Um, Rena, welcome. We see you're in your kitchen there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What are What are you experiencing in these last few weeks uh, in general with respect to the mortgage market and also as far as real real estate development goes? Um, what are your uh, What are your opinions, uh, thoughts with respect to financing mm -hmm. and completing uh, projects? Well, uh, a lot of lenders, both institutional and private in the commercial uh, and residential have either become more stringent on their lending guidelines or they're not lending at all. I would say about half of our private lenders want to wait and see what happens. Uh, they're concerned that the values may be dropping because they don't. nobody knows how long this situation is going to be going on and all this uncertainty. Um, also for private second mortgage lenders, the, the big concern is that if there's an institutional or even a private first, and if the borrower asks for a six month interest uh, or mortgage payment deferral, the, the situation is that those mortgage payments are gonna be added to the principal amount of the first mortgage. That would reduce the equity of the second mortgage. So if they did a second mortgage 80%, by the time the first mortgage adds on six months payments plus interest on interest, their second mortgage might be 90%. So they're afraid of that. And also it's difficult to enforce any security if there's a default because of the you know court situation. Um, everything is taking longer. You can't even really enforce your mortgage. So that's uh, one of the concerns. Um, as uh, far as residential institutional mortgages go, uh, the lenders are checking the, that the income is uh, verifiable, that it's, uh, if you're an essential service worker, it's much better, but is your job stability there? Will you still have a job? Um, and uh, so that's a concern as well. In the commercial market, uh, for retail plazas, 80% of the stores are not essential worker, essential stores, so they're all closed. Uh, lenders are concerned if the tenants are still going to pay the rent. Same with even apartment buildings, if the tenants will pay the rent. It's, it's just really difficult all around to uh, finance. Uh, deals are still getting done, but it's taking longer and they're harder to do. And a lot more uh, deals have to go private. Okay, very good. Rena, thanks very much. Um, I want to go back to uh, Ernest for a moment. Um, Ernest, the first there was an announcement that um, uh, real estate development construction could continue and then more recently it's frozen unless it's a city project or something like that. Can you, can you talk about that? And also there's a question from Terry Wallman here. He says, does commercial real estate exclude high rise residential development? Uh, hold on. Are you muted? No. Can we hear you? No, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Is yes. it okay? Is it better now? Yeah. Awesome. Um, first question. Is construction still going on? As far as I know, there's limited amount. Um, you can't just shut a construction site overnight and not keep it number one secured. And there's things that need to sort of, I think, Major having a you know a whole full blast crew going on there. I don't think that's happening. I haven't seen that. I've seen a little bit some of the smaller projects. Mind you, I haven't been driving around downtown to see exactly what's going on. But 
as per the rules, yes, there's supposed to be a, a on lockdown, shutdown, and things like that. Uh, some sites are still operation, as you said. Uh, highways are, I see some workers going on and, and you know, keeping whatever distance. I, I think that construction sites, as long as people are doing their best to, and the builders have to guarantee that they can provide safe work environments, um, <clears throat> some sites are, are happening. Suppliers uh, are not. I know people that are in the manufacturing, kitchen manufacturers and, and things like that and lumber yards. Uh, I've definitely cut down in lumber suppliers and, and window manufacturing is shut, cut back. So some of those things are obviously going to affect all of those things. Uh, Terry Wallman's question is commercial ri high rise, uh, com sorry, is com high rise development a commercial component? Um, I, I would say it's a part of a commercial investment component. It's, it's part of an investment project as a developer is investing in this project. So it is, it's an investment class per se. Uh, so it does fall under commercial, commercial, you know, as Rena would, commercial lending. And Terry, you would know better than anybody with about commercial, any type of lending. And so um, it's, you know, those are definitely going to be affected. You know, lenders, as you said, private money and the, you know, the banks are going to cut back. Where is this is all going? I don't know. People, the most, a lot of people I speak to, they think this is going to be, you know, it's going to go down and bounce right back up. Um, I'm of the opinion this is going to flatten out and how long that bottom line is going to, it's more of a U shape as opposed to, there's still a lot of demand. Um, the demand hasn't gone away. And, um, you know, so it depends how quickly we can all get back to whatever normal is going to be. I, I don't think, you know, people say, oh, we want to get back to normal. Well, I don't know. I have no idea what, what that's going to look like ever, you know, at least any time in the next 18, 20 more months. I can, uh, does that help? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in a bit on the uh, building. Um, I, I still have two uh, real estate fix and flip projects going. Uh, I've dodged two bullets so far from the provincial government. One, uh, they allowed us to continue like six weeks ago. And then a couple of weeks ago, they, uh, they shut down um, basically all building unless there were permits already issued. So fortunately we had our permits issued. So uh, I still have two construction crews actively going, going on. Now the logistics of building a house in this day and age, my God, uh, <laughs> to go to a hardware store and get some nails and screws, you know, you gotta line up for two hours to get a box of nails. So the logistics uh, is very demanding, but uh, we're still up and running just because we have a permit. So hopefully they don't uh, shoot us down because we gotta get these houses built. That's all. It's almost as bad as buying toilet paper, isn't it? Oh my God, it's unbelievable. Well, I guess if you started before a certain date, right? Uh, you're okay so far. Yeah, the kind of the rule of thumb was if you had a permit, if, you, if you're permit ready, uh, you could keep going, which, uh, hey, I'll be honest, I'm surprised. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, we try to uh, adhere to safe working conditions on our job sites, um, you know, but sometimes it's hard. You get two people that just sometimes building a house, it's not that easy keeping six feet apart all the time, but we try our best, so. Well, we're, we're doing some building as well. So we're having, number one, we're having a hard time getting the trades up. So some of them are okay, they have to, and others are, they're not coming to work. They said, you know, we're not coming near you guys. Yeah. Or, you know, that they even, they don't even want to yeah. talk to you. That's so there's that situation. And then the high rise buildings, it's a little bit different. You know, these guys are climbing, you know, they're in elevators together. They're, yeah. you know, side by side. If, you, if you're doing form work, you're, you're literally on top of each other. If you're pouring concrete, you're on top of each other. So those are the concerns. And these guys are traveling downtown, subway, TTC, and all of that fun factor. You know, you saw on the news, these guys freaking out, saying, you know, everybody's staying home. Why are we the ones? Like, we're not an essential service. Uh, they don't yeah. see themselves in essential service. And, and it's the union, the non-union, the people that have to work, the guys who, walk, you know, like us, Jerry, who, who, who have to keep things going in our trades, these guys are showing up. These are the self-employed people who don't have union jobs and, and, and they have to and keep there's, things there's going. Also a lot and, of the government is, yes, they're coming down to the rescue, but when, you know, they take well, a uh, couple of my home builders that are building uh, in single family custom homes, they're continuing their projects. Um, they're keeping only two to five workers. Uh, they're wearing gloves and masks. They're trying to keep six feet apart. 
like you said, you can't really shut down a construction project in the middle of it. Uh, but it is, uh, again, it is difficult to get workers. Uh, people are afraid. Uh, they don't want to bring anything home to their families. So, and everything is just going to be very slow. It'll take longer yeah, to build the house. Yeah. It's, it's not only that workers are afraid. I mean, uh, a lot of them have the options of just going and get the $2,000 the $2, a month and stay at home. <laughs> and to some people, that's a pretty good option. So, like, you're allowed to not go to the job site and stay at home and collect the $2,000. So... Well, I, I think I think to be they have to come home to families after spending a day with who knows right. There's a lot of stuff going on, materials, different people traveling. That they're you know they're, they're not not everybody is. The, most of the guys working downtown, which is hundreds and thousands of them, are they're not taking their car into the construction site. That's not happening. So they're all busing it, TTCing it, whatever. So there's that part of the fear of it's not only about them getting sick, but it's them transmitting this stuff. And I think this is where it becomes an issue. You know, this is the same thing that's happening to some of our guys. Our plumber, he refused to come on site. He says, you know, I live at home. I got my senior parents. I said, I can't afford it. I can't, afford, as much as I need to work, I, I can't afford to put my family and, and my parents at risk. So he says, and, and, I'm not. And you can't blame somebody for saying that. You can't. I don't. I would do the same no. thing. So hopefully uh, there are those that will work within the uh, measures that we put in place as far as uh, making it a safe work, uh, work, uh, work, work environment. So. <clears throat> Um, question for uh, Rena from uh, Terry Wallman. How is CYR handling determination of property values? Well, uh, we rely on the appraisers. And uh, mm -hmm. today for residential appraisal reports, they are not going into properties that are occupied. If it's a, a new builder home and there's not, not anybody living in there, they will go inside. Um, otherwise, they're doing what's called a modified report. They're inspecting the property from the outside, measuring the outside, and then the occupants can provide photographs or videos of the rooms. And the lenders are accepting these modified appraisal reports because there's no other way to do them at the present time. Um, as far as uh, commercial uh, reports go, uh, again, they're still uh, appraising them according to how they always did, using a cap rate, um, I don't think that uh, they've actually discounted the values due to the COVID situation, but they are putting in a clause in the report that uh, does mention that the, that the COVID uh, situation could affect the values as a, you know, to protect themselves. So still the values are still coming in according to the income the properties produce. Okay, thank you, uh, Rena. There's a question here. Um, it's like a multi-part question, but I'm going to read it quickly. You guys, the panelists can see it, uh, uh, should be able to see it. Since the shutdown, uh, do you know of new condo projects being launched or are you aware of new land purchase initiated after the shutdown? Are we aware of any residential projects in Ontario which are still operating what percentage do you say did get slowed down in your field? So it's, it's a multi-part question, but does anyone want to take a shot at any of those components? I'll jump in a little bit, start in, but <clears throat> I mean, again, if you have a permit, you're good to go. Uh, my uh, young son, he's an electrical apprentice. He's still working on a condo building in, uh, in Waterloo. So those projects are still going on. I'm still building because I have a permit. Uh, so again, that's the cri criteria. There are projects on the go. Uh, I forget the should be. Let me just see the rest of that question. Um, are there any new land purchase initiated after the shutdown? Uh, well, I mean, there's there's going to be bargain hunters out there after this. Uh, there's boy, on a positive note, I don't mean to be opportunistic, uh, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities coming up. Bankruptcy is already showing up. Yeah, there's people that are, you know, uh, I mean, again, it's sad, but there's people that are going to lose their projects. And, uh, you know, those projects have to be bought up by somebody else and completed. So, you know, the people that are in the business of doing that, we're going to keep our eyes open. And you don't want to be opportunistic. And I'm not saying we are, but if there's an opportunity, you're going to jump on it. By the way, for financing land, it's getting close to impossible right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the lenders who were doing land have decided to step back and not do it for a while. And one lender that we had said they're not going to lend on land till the end of the year. Um, so it's really difficult to get money 
uh, for land. It definitely, unless you're, you know, Tridel or something. Uh, but uh, for smaller builders or even medium-sized residential stack townhouse projects or condo projects, you, it's, it's um, it, unless you can get a vendor take back, it's almost impossible to get land financing now. So based on what Rena said, I mean, uh, there's again opportunities for those people that are in the private mortgage lending uh, business, uh, those that have funds to lend, there are good opportunities out there. You can get good loan to value, you can get good interest rates for those people that are still willing to pay and still continue on with projects even after this uh, this COVID thing is, is, is behind us. So uh, those of you with money out there, uh, think of, uh, private lending as an investment op opportunity. Um, Rena, you get a much better rate as well, because since it's so difficult to get money, right. a private lender could charge 10 to 12% interest plus fees. They can get right. a really good return on their money. Rena, and also you would take a prepayment of interest for like an interest right. reserve for the year since land doesn't produce any income. So it's not possible for there to, for there to be a default. The only concern is will the values drop? Right, of course. Yeah. And that's just back again. We have to make sure that the value, pro the, 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 the asset properly protects the value of the investment, which, which goes back to investing 101, which is again why we like residential real estate income trust in the private world. So, Ernest, what do you got? Some hot deals there you want to share with us? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I was saying, you know, these, these are already, I mean, it's, if you really look around, there's probably been, I don't know the exact number because I haven't tracked a lot of these deals don't even come to into the MLS system, but there was a few deals that have gone into receivership. Uh, people who bought overbought or lower leverage or they're, you know, like I said, they, things got delayed and, and now they're carrying a lot of stuff. You know, Rena said, uh, Tridel, you know, they're going to show up. I think all of those guys, you know, they bought a lot of land. They're, they got a lot of money put out. And uh, I think smart money is just gonna wait and see. I think, you know, there's, uh, it's, you know, they're circling the wagons, I would think, and waiting to see when is the good time to, to get in the market. And, you know, nobody knows. The problem is, you know, it's, we can sit here all day and talk about if this and if that, and that goes this way, that goes that way. I don't, um, the reality is, you know, I think if, if, if the project comes on the market, if, you know, 70% uh, of value, 60% of value, will they, somebody buy it? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody that will buy it uh, because, you know, this, this will blow over. Um, you know, it's not like we're back in, in the 90s where the, the lenders were sitting on thousands of properties to sell and they were firing them off like it's going out of style. You know, even if they, these receivers have to do proper accounting, the proper, proper things, uh, you know, they have to try to get the best and highest value. As we get more properties, if that happens, then you're going to see some of those bargain opportunities. And some builders will turn around and possibly say they have no choice. It's not going to be any different with the residential market. You know, I, I feel for these small businesses. We talk about these big businesses. They'll be okay. There'll be lots of bailout or something for them. Um, I, I look around in, in my neighborhood, I'm thinking that, I don't know, 20, 30% of these businesses, I, I can't see them coming back. You know, I, I, if this takes another month or two to, to, for them to open up, I doubt it. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Rena. I was just going to say how uh, a lot of our private lenders are solving the problem of all this uncertainty is uh, they're, most of them want to take a prepaid interest. So for example, in the GTA, we still have a lot of private money around six and a quarter percent for first mortgages up to 60, 65 percent. Um, but the interest has to be prepaid. Say, and there's also second mortgage money still up to 80 percent. The lenders that were going like 85 to 90 percent have you know, pretty much dried up but we can still get to 80%. And as long as it's prepaid, there can't be a default. The only, again, as I mentioned, is what will happen to the values. How long is this going to take um, if the values drop? That's, their, that's the only concern. Rena, um, have private lenders uh, that are still willing to lend, are they looking for an increase uh, in rate or lender fee at this time? Um, well, those funds I was telling you that are at six and a quarter or maybe six and a half, 
they charge like a one and a half to 2% fee. They have not increased their fees. For That's pretty much the going rate for private money, for fees, I mean. Okay, very good. Um, the question here for Ernest or Rena, have you seen a greater willingness of sellers to close transactions with vendor take back mortgages or merely allow sales to crater if the buyer isn't able to arrange financing? Well, I, in most cases, if they need a, you know, a short extension, a week or two weeks, and there is definitely the possibility of them closing the deal, they are going to give a short extension. Most sellers are reasonable. Um, I do not see a lot of vendor take backs, only like with developers on land purchases mainly are the vendor take backs. It's uh, maybe one out of 50 deals, there might be a vendor take back second. It's not uh, so popular. Rena, comments on commercial lending? Commercial lending, uh, it's still being done. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, show which uh, retail outlets are open that are essential services. The ones that are closed, we need to show that they're still paying the rent. The landlord has to provide bank statements proving he's depositing the rents. Um, the uh, requirements are, again, are still more stringent. A, a lot of the lenders have stopped lending or like just taking a break for a month or two, but we are still uh, doing deals and uh, for, and some of them are at, at pretty good rates. Um, especially for apartment buildings, CMHC insured, we just got a commitment for $4 million at 1.64% for five years. So wow. those are, I've never seen rates in the ones before, wow. but apartment buildings, if you do them CMHC insured, this is the time to finance. The rates have never been lower and the banks uh, are happy to do them because they're insured by Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which means that if there was ever a loss, the, the uh, CMHC would cover their loss. So they're guaranteed they can never lose. And uh, yeah, the rates are phenomenal. Rena, do you think we'd ever get back? Remember a number of years ago, we used to have a product where if you had good credit and you had a down payment with at least some portion of it uh, coming from your own resources, you didn't even have to have bank statements. Do you think we'd ever get back to having something like that? I doubt it. You know, only in the private market. <laughs> no, uh, there are some, you know, small private lenders mix that they have some mix that have no income qualified. Uh, but again, uh, a lot of them are taking the prepaid interest. If I can jump in, I like what Rena is saying about these government uh, gar gar guaranteed loans, because even the uh, Business Development Bank of Canada has now, the, the, the government has, has offered uh, higher uh, guarantees on those types of lending also. Uh, so it, 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 behooves, it behooves us all to go and, uh, you know, explore those lending opportunities that are government backed because now there's a lot of it and they're not asking as many questions a lot of times if it's government, uh, government guar guaranteed. Uh, I always think it's a great idea to go uh, get as much credit as you can. I'm not a real advocate to uh, go spend all the equity you have, but to be in a position to uh, have that credit available to jump on opportunities, I think is always important. So to go out and source, uh, you know, where, as Rena says, uh, you know, one point something on an, uh, on an apartment loan. I mean, that's, that's an opportunity. Uh, you have to be ready uh, for that. And you have to have the uh, financing, the line of credit possibly in place, uh, ready to jump. So again, I think it's good to explore all these options as the government is kind of uh, guaranteeing a lot of this uh, lending that's going on. Well, I think Jerry, that kind of underscores uh, our earlier discussion about, uh, you know, REITs as a category because of those uh, multi-residential apartment buildings are very favorable investments and, uh, CMHC obviously likes them and makes the financing as, as attractive as ever. Yes. Um, Gary, Sorry. there's Can a I jump in on something there, David. Go ahead. You made a good point. And inside of these REITs, if they go and refinance their buildings at one point some percent, what do you think that does to the prop prof profitability of the REIT? It, it, it's fantastic. So Anyway, sorry. They'll have to pay a penalty on their existing financing. So they have no, to I understand that. But even, even for new purchases or anything yeah. else, more mm -hmm. to do. Sorry, David. I, I yeah, no, no, that's a very good point. It might still be worthwhile to uh, refinance and even pay the penalty, depending, you know, what it is. So, yeah. 
so in case anybody's wondering, I just wanted to mention because, uh, you know, some of you may know that I'm also a mortgage broker. So the reason I've invited Rena um, on the line to assist in this conversation is because um, she's been around for a few years, uh, over 40 years uh, as a mortgage broker. She was the uh, chair of the industry association for a number of years, one of the top producing commercial mortgage brokers in Canada, actually. And, you know, occasionally we, we uh, as mortgage brokers, we do get stumped. And um, so I, I often do go to Rena for assistance on, on various transactions and we're good friends and we work together on a number of uh, opportunities, right, Rena? Yes, David, I really enjoy working with you. You're a pleasure. You're a very nice person, very honest, and a very professional. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your friendship as well. Thank you very much, Rena. Thank you. Um, Jerry, there's a, a, just kind of opening it up, um, yeah. the discussion to some of the earlier things we were talking about. There was a question which I accidentally deleted having to do with the $2,000 a month. Um, if you can, if you can tell us more about that, and then you'll see the last uh, one of the last questions has to do with the CERB as it applies to students. I don't know if you can comment on that. Um, uh, my son was supposed to start an apprenticeship program in June, but everything's on hold. Uh, he works part time in a grocery store, but is elected not to work for fear of exposing the family. Can he claim the CERB? So this CERB, again, they still have this qualification that you needed to make $5,000 last year, which is getting a lot of flack. Uh, so if a student didn't have any income at this point, they do not qualify. Uh, the government has brought out a program to pay 100% of student wages for. So if a company hires a student, uh, uh, through 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 these uh, student programs, the government will pay 100% of their wages. Uh, that doesn't help a student at this point. Right now, can they access the $2,000? Uh, no, if they had no income. Now, we expect that to change. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that are probably going to change because there's a lot of flack from these sole proprietors, these people that really work on their own and have all the, the same business risks as anybody else, but they're excluded so far from getting the not only the $40,000 loan, but some of the other incentives. Uh, some of these students, uh, the e, I just want to touch quickly, if I can, on the EI issue, because there's all kinds of people who are laid off. They're filing for EI. They're filing for the curb. Uh, simple terms, March 15th, if you apply for EI before March 15th, you are going down the EI route. You cannot collect curb. If you filed for EI after March 15th, uh, your, your EI application would have automatically been transferred into the curb system. Okay, so I've heard of people getting both EI and CURB uh, because they applied for EI earlier than they applied for the CURB. You can't get both. You will be asked to repay if you filed your EI application before March 15th. And if you did get EI and if you did get CURB, you're going to have to repay that CURB. Okay, so you can't collect both one or the other. March 15th is, a, is the day if you file before or after. And understand not only EI, but the curb too is taxable. It's taxable income. It's going to land on your tax return next year. You're going to pay tax on it, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of giving people money. Uh, now you got to pay tax tax on it again next next year and boy for those uh for those people that are collect both ei and curb which you're not supposed to do good luck for the government trying to get that money back <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, can i ask a question also about the uh wage subsidy program where the government is supposed to cover 75 percent of wages has that uh, been opened up to apply for yet no that uh opens up on monday april 27th Okay, that, that, that is when the door opens for that program and people can start uh, flying. So there's no money flowing yet for the wage subsidy program. April 27th is when the applications open up, when the actual money starts flowing, who knows. Uh, the curb, the $2,000 a month thing, uh, sorry, yeah, 2000 a month, that's flowing. That, that's flowing quite freely. People are getting it very, very, very uh, quick. So that's the good news. The, um, yeah, so the 40,000, Dollar loan, uh, that program is administered through banks. You go through the bank. Uh, I've not yet seen anybody receive that money yet. So it's a slow process too. So the curb is really the only money that's really flowing at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Rena, uh, 
CMHC insurance premium for apartment building financing, and also can you talk about interest rate uh, re interest rates on development and construction? Well, right now um, we still have private money for construction, um, and that would be around eight to nine percent interest rate, and about three percent fees about 75% of the cost of the project for land, hard and soft costs and not more than 65% of the completed value. So that is still available. Um, again, the funds are limited. There's not a lot of lenders doing it, but we still have a lot of money available. Like we have one lender who has a billion dollars available. So there's still money if the project makes sense. Okay, and the CMH insurance premium, uh, top, uh, top. Oh, that was not CMHC. Yeah, that was not CMHC. That was the private construction. Under team. Understood. Well, yeah. I mixed two questions together. So okay. the, second, the second question has to do with CMHC insured financing. And I'm wondering, like, do you find, because I know they'll say they'll go up to 85%, do you find that inevitably it ends up being less than 85% because of the way CMHC does their own valuations? Yes, absolutely. It's 85% of their opinion of the value. So their opinion is never uh, the same as reality. They're a little more conservative. So um, when you're applying for a multifamily CMHC loan, they do not require an appraisal. They charge $150 per unit, which includes their building uh, inspection as well as appraisal. But I always recommend getting an appraisal done as well. So you have ammunition to argue with CMHC and I have the appraiser do a schedule of comparable vacancy rates, com market rents, uh, comparable cap rates. So um, if for people who might not know what a cap rate is, it's a, a formula that's used to determine the income value of the property. And the higher the cap rate that the lender uses, the lower the value. The lower the cap rate, the higher the value. So our job is to convince them to use a lower vacancy rate and a lower cap rate to get the maximum value to, to get the loan amount that we're asking for. But usually it really works out to about 75%. Right, and, and at the top tier, the uh, premium is around 5% or something like that? Um, it's 4.5% at 85%. And there's a sliding scale. You can go to CMHC's website. They list their uh, multifamily premiums there. So there's a different premium if it's 65%, 70, 75, 80, 85. Right. I, I think it's worth mentioning too, though, that pr that, that uh, premium is good for the life of the loan. So uh, even yeah. past the initial uh, you know, term, like if you take a five-year term and you know, so as long as you, so you'll save roughly a point or more, I think, on your ongoing rate by having it CMHC insured for the yeah. life of the loan. Usually the, C, the financing you get CMHC insured is a one to one and a half percent below a conventional mortgage rate. And as you mentioned, uh, that uh, in, insurance premium will last the whole 25 year amortization and you don't pay it out of your pocket. It's added to the loan amount and it's tax deductible. So after five years or even 10 years, there's 10 year terms available as well when you want to renew or you could transfer that CMHC mortgage to another lender if they're giving you a better rate, you're always going to save one to one and a half percent of what the interest rate would be if you had gone conventional. So it's a great savings on a long term hold. Okay, very good. Hey, David, can I jump in? I see in a question that needs some, yeah, please do. some clarification. So I'm seeing that there's some confusion on the uh, curb. I'm, I'm back to the curb thing. Uh, the $5,000, somebody's brought up the $1,000. Okay, so here's, you need to have made $5,000 last year in order to qualify to apply for curb. Once you qualify to apply for curb, the old rule said you couldn't have any income uh, the new rule, the revised rule from last week says you're allowed to make a thousand dollars a month. Okay, so you still need to make five thousand last year in order to qualify. Once you qualify, you're allowed to collect the two thousand dollars and still make a thousand dollars a month doing whatever you're doing. So hopefully that uh, there's a couple of questions on the Q and A. So hopefully that clar clarifies that. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Rena, rates for uh, land acquisition commercial purchase of land? 
Okay, well, uh, you're looking anywhere from eight and a half to 10% interest. It's uh, maybe like uh, 50 to 60% of the value. And again, it's not easy to get. Okay, very good. Um, there's, there's a question from Roman uh, regarding LTV on private second mortgages. I'm going to uh, take a shot at that one. I've still seen some lenders advertising uh, 80%, and unless I'm uh, mistaken, I've seen them advertising as high as 85 but I think um, those would have to be uh, for very, very uh, squeaky clean applications because as Rena mentioned earlier, uh, lenders are scaling back um and uh, their concern so but uh, but there is there is still money around there are some mix that are uh, aggressive uh, net more aggressive uh in good times and and some of them are still putting out money so so there is um there is money around for for good deals um Ernest, do you have anything to add to all this? You guys should take a look through the uh, questions there's a lot of questions that we haven't touched on the panelists um, can just scroll through the questions here. Uh, since we're gathering information as an active team, do we see a possibility to share off-market distressed properties with this network? Um, uh, let me jump in there. Uh, you know, again, uh, we don't want to be opportunistic, but uh, there's going to be a lot, and I mean a lot, of bargains out there. You're going to see private equity companies formed just to create opportunity funds to access whatever's out there that people are walking away from. So, um, you know, my eyes are going to be open uh, as, as everybody else's will be. So as far as acts, you know, I mean, again, you know, this, uh, this um, webinar we're doing is going to be ongoing every couple of weeks, I think, David. So, you know, as new information comes out, we'll certainly share it with the uh, public. Yeah. And uh, we would encourage people to get a hold of us. So, Jerry, somebody was asking for your phone number. You can type it right in there unless you want to announce it. Um, oh, yeah. Go so, ahead. Okay. So, uh, my phone number, 416-979-7426. Uh, feel free to go to my website, canadianinvestmentservices.com or .ca. You'll have all my contact information there. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Rena, do you want to give us your phone number while we're going around the circle here? Yeah, definitely. So uh, now because of the virus situation, I'm working at home. So the best number to reach me on is my cell, which is 647-838-5061. And uh, if you, the office number is, uh, if you needed to reach anybody else in our office, all their home numbers or cell numbers are on there. It's 905-731-1111. Thank you, Rena. Ernest, do you have any thoughts? We're, we're just, we're going to wrap up this segment now with um, uh, Rena uh, and Ernest. We appreciate you guys uh, uh, joining us very much. And we've done our best to, to get to all the um, questions. Um, there are some that we have not been able to answer still, but feel free to reach out to us uh, individually. Uh, Ernest, um, uh, before we close off this segment, Jerry and I will have a little uh, chat afterwards. Um, can you give us your, your um, uh, closing thoughts on this, please? And then uh, also give us your phone number. Oh, I guess I should unmute him. Hello, Ernest, can you hear us? Yes, say something. Maybe his, he's have, could be having some internet issues today. Um, we lost him, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had him for a while, so. We had him for a good time, not a long time. Um, Anyway, sorry about that, Ernest. Okay, Jerry, Rena, thanks again for joining us. Joining us, we appreciate it. Stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, Rena. Thank you, everybody. Take care. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye for care. now. Bye, bye. bye. Jerry. Yes, sir. Okay. Lots so, of good. Lots of good questions. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. That's good. I think we uh, touched on a lot of stuff here. So, someone's still asking me about this two thousand curb. And yeah, how, go ahead. Go and ahead. How, how often they have to apply for it? So it is applied for. There's 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 three periods right now: March fifteen to April eleven, April twelve to May nine, May ten to June six. 
the two thousand dollar monthly curb uh, at, at this point you're uh, you have to apply separately for each time okay there's four times they're allowing you to apply so right now you Assuming you qualify, you get the uh, $8,000 in total, but you have to reapply every time to get the $2,000. Okay, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Was there anything else that uh, you wanted to touch on from the list? Um, well, I think we covered a lot. Again, we did a good chat on the Real Estate Income Trust. I hope people uh, get a good idea of what those type of investments about are are all about. Uh, it's important for these people to realize that there's public REITs and private REITs and there's a big difference in the two of them. Uh, I think it's important uh, for people to realize how these REITs are valued in a very simplistic way, uh, balance sheet and income statement. There's my accounting background coming, coming out, but it's very simple. The value of the building plus the value of the income. Uh, again, a lot of businesses, when, when, when they go through crisis like this, uh, you know, a lot of these businesses lose their income stream. Uh, the value of a business is driven from income. And if you lose your income stream, you know, your business value is gonna go down a lot. So again, I've always uh, been an advocate for these type of real estate uh, residential REITs because their income is so solid and basically guaranteed. You can't say it's guaranteed, but basically, uh, you know, if, the, if, if these residential REITs are in the right location, which according to me is a, a two hour radius outside of Toronto, if you go from London to Waterloo to Owen Sound to really to Peterborough, that whole uh, span outside of Toronto, um, these are all areas where apartment buildings, uh, residential apartment buildings become really good investments because of their location and, and the fact that their income stream uh, will always be there. Uh, people need a place to live. And especially if they're structured in the, $1,000 to $2,000 monthly rent. Uh, I myself try to stay away from the high-end REITs, the, 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 the buildings where you need three or $4,000 monthly rent to make the math work. Uh, the math works quite well at $1,000 to $2,000 of monthly rent. So I think we covered that topic uh, pretty uh, good, I think. What do you think, David? You're, uh, you're a newly uh, dealing rep uh, in the private equity world. Again, congratulations. Maybe you should uh, explain people what brought you to that. Uh, Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Well, you know, I mean, in, in any business, marketing is half the battle. And uh, what I determined a number of years ago was that um, people, uh, generally speaking, most people are thinking frequently about their investments, but they only need a mortgage, you know, unless they're a developer or something like a property investor where they own multiple properties. Most people only need a mortgage like once every five years or something like that. But um, on an on a almost daily basis, people are thinking about their investments and how are they performing and are, are they in the right uh, sort of investments. And um, so, uh, you know, the mortgage industry started uh, promoting the syndicated mortgages a number of years, which uh, probably got people into a lot of hot water. Um, I could see uh, <clears throat> I could see that they were problematic, and I undertook to get licensed as a dealing rep. I started the process a few years ago, actually, and um, finally consummated um, the whole thing uh, because um, uh, because the timing was right. So, um, uh, you know, Jerry, it's a pleasure to have had the association with you. And again, I thanks for, thank you for inviting me uh, for introducing me to the good to Brian Mizzy and, and the good people at Huxton Black. Uh, they seem like a really uh, great group. And um, yeah, this Pulis, I've known about it for a number of years. I've uh, been doing some research on this and uh, I really like what they do. I like the Hamilton Marketplace. Uh, I've had my eye on that for a while. It is no longer a steel town, but uh, has uh, quite a number of hospitals and universities. And so that's the area that they've been, uh, they've been working on and have a great track record. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Brian Mizzy mentioned, there's a window of opportunity now. Uh, we also have another window with another firm, uh, Jerry, as you know, that we deal with uh, called the Centurion REIT. Yeah. Uh, and um, they normally have um, limited uh, uh, opportunities during uh, the typical year. And they have a window now, but uh, they may extend it through May uh, or they may not. We're waiting to hear. And if they, if they do extend it, we're going to have um, uh, Brian Frazier from uh, Centurion Reed. That's another 
yeah, Reed it's awesome. has a, a it's great, a uh, great, great uh, awesome. history and track record. Yeah. Well, I, for one, want to welcome you to this investment world. I'm glad you uh, came over to this. Uh, another thing to add to when, when, when we talk about REITs, again, private versus public, the great thing about a private REIT is you get to really uh, work with the owners of the company. Uh, that doesn't happen in the public market. So these private REITs, uh, I know Poulos, uh, you know, I can go in their office, I can ask some questions about their financial statements as an accountant. I understand all this stuff. Like when there is good access in the private world to the managers and owners of these REITs. Uh, and really that's what drives a good business. You can have the best business model in the world, but if you don't have the proper management or ownership, uh, the business is going to go down the toilet. So again, in the private REIT world, we get a good opportunity to our, do our due diligence on the owners and the management of those companies. And, and we're in constant contact with them uh, to make sure that, you know, that, uh, you know, what, what they're doing is, is in the best interest of our clients. So that, that's a great thing that happens in the world of private REITs that just does not happen in the public market. Okay, I think um, we may have Ernest back now. He didn't get to uh, leave us on a positive note. Ernest, um, any closing comments? And I noticed you left your phone number there, which is good. You can mention it again if you want. Sure. Uh, my number is, my direct line is 416 539 997. Thanks, Ernest. Okay, thank you very much, Ernest. Um, there's a, sorry, there's a question here on the $20,000 pay, payroll, if I can. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. I, I said, okay, so someone's asking the question again. We go back to the uh, $40,000 government pro program uh, to help out these businesses. The first qualification, as I mentioned before, was that you had to have a $50,000 pay, payroll. They revised that last week that uh, the 50 went down to 20. So you still need a $20,000 payroll in order to qualify for this $40,000 loan. Someone asked if we see that going down. Uh, I hope so. I hope they eliminate it. It's not fair. There's just way too many businesses out there that need that money uh, and, and cannot access it because they don't have $20,000 in payroll. So uh, there's a lot of pressure. I know there's been a lot of people reaching out to their member of parliaments to uh, try to change that. So uh, every day uh, they make new changes. I mean, it's, it's, it's good and bad. It's kind of frustrating because in all those programs that the government is offering, there are still many, many, many questions that we literally cannot answer because we don't have all the information or facts. Uh, so, but every day they come out and they say something new. So I would hope that that $40,000 loan will be uh, accessible to many more people, uh, hopefully this uh, coming week. So we'll see. Okay, very good, Jerry. Um, so uh, people are asking again, if this is being recorded. Yes, it is. So next time I send out an email, we're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll provide a link to this. Um, uh, and uh, my phone number is in the email too that I sent out. I'll just mention it here again in case you're watching now and would like to make a note of it. It's 416-876-2031. Again, 876-2031. Uh, feel free to call me as well. Um, and uh, any closing thoughts, Jerry? No, oh, uh, thank you for making this happen, David. Um, you know, uh, I think it was an interesting topic. I look forward to uh, bringing everybody up to date uh, next next week. Um, I will add, if somebody is interested, I have a nice little brochure. If you can see it here, it explains the investment market to place. It's a little reference brochure. If anybody wants it, send me an email. I can send 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 you a copy. Uh, I think it's important for people to better understand the investment marketplace as a whole. I've always preached that. I'm an advocate of it. The, the better you understand the marketplace, the better you understand the investments that you're in. Uh, that's one way to manage risk. So I'm a real advocate to better understand the investments that you're in as well as the overall investment marketplace. So that uh, reference book I just showed you, that's uh, got a lot of information about better understanding just the overall market place. So. So they, can, they can email you to get a copy of that, Jerry? Or? Yeah, they can. Uh, email is jerry at canadianinvestmentservices.com. Okay, very good. And you can reach me at david at rockyourmortgage.ca. Like the sign says behind me. <laughs> All right. All other, right, great. Other side. <laughs> there you go. You got it.
<laughs> okay, everything's inverted. Okay. All right. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. We had uh, we had as many as a hundred people on the call at one awesome. point in time, which is which is our maximum. We may have to ex expand our uh, bridge. We had a ton of great questions. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If you have um, more questions or anything in particular you'd like to discuss, please call uh, any of the panelists that were here today. We look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to having your feedback and suggestions regarding uh, future sessions. In the meantime, stay safe. Uh, yeah. And uh, we'll uh, see you in a couple weeks, if not before. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care.